morning again. Morning. How many of you have ever had a day? Let's, let's do this with amens instead of raising the hands this morning. I'll try to get you amen and early uh, in the message. How many of you have ever had a day when everything went wrong? Amen. amen. Anybody have a day like that this week? Uh, they, they, they tend to happen, and they can happen frequently and often. I want to start this morning by telling you about one of my days where everything went wrong. Today, I'll never forget, it was April 23rd, 2016. It was a Saturday. Um, my son and I were coming back from Tyler, Texas. I had been invited to speak at a conference up there, and we were flying home in my airplane. Many of you know that I'm a pilot, and I uh, frequently use the plane to get around to do things like that. We were flying back, and we were making good time. We had a nice little tailwind. We were doing a little over 200 miles an hour. We were approaching Austin, flying just east of Austin. We were going to kind of skirt across the east side of Austin, the east side of San Marcos, the east side of New Braunfels. Had about 35 minutes left in the flight, according to the GPS, and everything was going great. We had just been handed off from Houston Center to uh, Austin Approach because we were fairly close to their airspace and the way they were taking off that day was right into our flight path. And so Houston Center handed us off. We checked in with Austin Approach. I had just made the radio call to check in. The controller came back. It was a very nice lady. She told me to be watching for a Southwest jet, a 737 that was taking off in our direction and would be climbing into our flight path. As soon as she said... Those words, my son Peter, who was seven at the time, said, Daddy, I smell smoke. And I had smelled it too, just, just at the instant he was saying it. And I said, I do too. And as soon as I said, I do too, he said, Daddy, I see smoke. And I saw it too. It started pouring out of our dash, the instruments right in front of us. Smoke started pouring out. I could tell instantly it was electrical. You can, it just has a unique smell to it. And at that moment, I felt like absolutely everything was going wrong. It is the absolute nightmare of every pilot to have a fire in flight, much less a fire inside the cabin with you. My son, seven, is sitting next to me. We have a a commercial jet taking off, coming into our flight path. Just a lot going on in the moment. I instinctively knew that the next few minutes of my life were going to be very important. In fact, most pilots don't live to tell the tale. I glanced to the right and I saw that jet taking off. It was a beautiful, clear Saturday. Praise the Lord for that. I saw the jet, it had just left the runway, and it was indeed climbing, and we were going to intersect in some way, shape, or form. And as I was looking for the jet, I was instinctively reaching with my left hand for the master switches, which in my airplane are over here. I knew I didn't have time to make any kind of a radio call. I flipped the master switches off, which turned off all the electrical power in the airplane, because I could tell it was an electrical fire. Didn't have time to make a radio call, didn't have time to tell the controller what was happening. We just turned everything off. Peter said, I'm going to get the fire extinguisher, which I remember thinking in my head, that's a really good idea. And I was really impressed that my seven-year-old son had, had thought about that. While he was reaching for the fire extinguisher, which is located just, just right behind us, as he was getting that out of its harness and reaching for that, I'm watching the Southwest jet, keeping an eye on it, and I'm starting what's called an emergency descent, because if you have a fire, you want to get on the ground as fast as you can. So I've started the emergency descent. I'm going through my memory checklist for an emergency descent and for a fire. He pulls the fire extinguisher out. He gets it up in his lap, and just as he does, the Southwest jet crosses in front of us and above us, a couple of miles away, it wasn't danger close or anything, but I knew the Southwest jet was now out of our way. And I could see the San Marcos airport just in front of us, and I could even see the New Braunfels airport just beyond it. And it was about that time that I noticed the smoke had stopped and was dissipating. It was coming out of the cabin. So 
whatever it was, it was over, I hoped, and the cabin started clearing out of the smoke, and we didn't have to use the fire extinguisher. At that point, I started looking at my gauges. The airplane was running incredibly well. I mean, like nothing had ever happened. And so I leveled off. I quit our emergency descent and started running through the checklist. I had a few minutes now. Felt like things were more under control. So I got the checklist out, started running through the checklist. Part of the checklist is to bring things back up. I was able to get a radio on, get the controller back on, declare an emergency. She offered to bring us back to Austin. I said I wanted San Marcos because it was just in front of us. We ended up landing in New Braunfels because we had plenty of height and plenty of time. The smoke went away, the fire went away, and uh, we, you know, felt safe enough to go a few miles further. And I happened to know there was an avionics shop in New Braunfels because I had used it before, and I figured the airplane was going to need some work. So a few more minutes passed, and we landed at New Braunfels. Safe, uneventful landing. Everything was great. Uh, we went into the FBO. There were some pilots sitting in there who had been listening to the radio traffic and had heard what was going on, and they congratulated us, and we told them the whole story, and it was pretty cool. Uh, we also had to make a phone call to mom, to Abby, and tell Abby she needed to come get us in New Braunfels. Her first question was, why? I said, oh, don't worry about it. Just, just come get us. Probably better we talk about this one in person. And so we waited about an hour and a half for her to load the other kids up and come up to New Braunfels to pick us up. And while we were, these other pilots landed who had heard the story, and we told them the story, and there were lots of congratulations going on in the pilot's lounge, and we were telling the story. And I, I kept telling Peter, like, when mom gets here, let me tell her what happened. <laughs> and he kept saying, okay, dad, okay. And I, I knew she was about 10 minutes away. She called us to get directions to where we were at the airport. And uh, so I told her, I knew she was about 10 minutes away. I reminded Peter again. I said, hey, when mom gets here, just let me tell her what happened, okay? He was like, okay, okay. And so New Braunfels, the FBO, has those sliding doors. You know those automatic doors? I'll never forget it. A door slid open. There's my beautiful wife coming towards us. Peter jumps up and starts running to mom. Mommy, 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 daddy's plane caught on fire and almost burned us up. <laughs> it was a long ride home. <clears throat> In hindsight, when it was all said and done, the issue was caused by a very small and innocent mistake that a mechanic had made almost a decade before I got the plane. A freak thing caused a freak electrical short to happen, and that small, innocent mistake the mechanic had made almost 10 years prior led to that electrical short, bypassing all the safety features to stop such a thing from happening, and basically just burnt up all the wires behind the dash. And you might be saying, well, why is he telling us that story? It's because it's a great illustration for our big idea today. The big idea is this, everything needs to be right before everything goes wrong. Think about that. Everything needs to be right before everything goes wrong. As I thought about that flight in the days and weeks that passed, as I talked to other pilots about what had happened, my pilot friends, it was clear that we had such a good, successful, and ultimately safe outcome that day because even though everything went wrong, the worst thing that you can imagine as a pilot went wrong but the reason we had such a good outcome was because everything else was right. We weren't flying in instrument conditions. We, we weren't in the clouds. There weren't thunderstorms around. We, we weren't flying at night or in the dark. I was current. My instincts were good. My skills were proficient. I had memorized all the necessary checklists to do the things that needed to be done instantaneously in that event by some stretch of God's grace, I was able to stay calm, and my training kicked in, and just things happened right. Everything else in the airplane was right and functioning at its best. The entire day could have gone completely different. In fact, much differently, for example, if I just would have had a weak battery, because we had to turn all the power off. The alternators and everything just had to get turned off. If I had a weak battery, we couldn't have got the landing gear down without trying to manually crank it down. 
The whole day could have gone completely different had everything else with the airplane not been right. We had four airports within our vicinity to land at. We had a controller that did an amazing job. Later learned when I came back on to declare the emergency that she had directed the Southwest jet out of our path because she knew something had happened when we turned everything off. Peter didn't start crying. He didn't start freaking out. He didn't start trying to jump out the door or something, right? He actually helped by getting the fire extinguisher and allowed me to focus on other things, namely flying the airplane and doing the things I needed to do. And that didn't just happen by accident. It didn't just happen because he's a bright, smart kid. It actually happened because we had talked about multiple times, what do we do if there's a fire? It was actually part of our pre-flight briefing before we ever left Tyler. How do you unbuckle your seatbelt? How do you get out the door? How do you open the emergency exit? Where is the fire extinguisher, and how do you unlatch it? You see, because everything else was right and ready, we were ready when everything went wrong. Today we're going to start this series in the book of Job. And if you have never read the book of Job, you are in for an adventure over the next couple of weeks, a great ride over the next couple of months as we look at this guy's life. And you talk about a guy that everything went wrong for. But he never wavered. That's why we've titled the series Unwavering. His faith was strong. His faith was steady. He never wavered through it all. And today, what I I just want you to look at is, and this may be the most important thing of the whole series, what I want you to see that is that when everything went wrong for Job, the reason he had such a successful outcome was because everything else was right. It's probably the biggest secret to Job's ability to remain unwavering when literally everything in his life was going wrong. Before anything went wrong, everything else was right. We're just going to look at one verse today. The first verse in this book, Job 1.1. Here's what it says if you want to read it with me. There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. Before we look at the man and how he got everything right before everything went wrong, I think we should very quickly consider the place that this happened. That's point number one, the place The place where it all happened isn't extremely spiritually significant in any way. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but it's mentioned in the text, so I think we should at least touch on it. It says in verse 1, there was a man in the country of Uz named Job. Can any of you tell me where the country of Uz is? It's been a while since you've been in geography, hasn't it? Uh, Maybe some of our smart young students who've taken world geography more recently can tell us. Anybody tell us where the country of Uz is? Don't feel too bad if you don't know. The reality is nobody knows exactly where Uz was. There are three people in the Bible with the name of Uz. First is found in Genesis chapter 10. He's the son of Aram and the grandson of Shem. You can read about it in Genesis 10, 22. The second was actually Abraham's nephew, and, and he actually had a brother named Buzz. <laughs> Uz and Buzz. Now, parents, can you imagine trying to shout your boys down, Buzz and Uz? <laughs> I guarantee you that twisted up their tongues at some point. There's a third person by the name of Uz. He's an idiomite, one of the sons of Deshaun, the, the Horite who lived in Seir in Genesis 36, 28. You can also read about it in 1 Corinth, uh, First Chronicles uh, chapter 1. Again, we're not certain, but the leading theory is it's probably this third person who named the country of Uz after himself. Another detail about the country of Uz is mentioned in Jeremiah 25 where it says this, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his officers his leaders, and all his people, and this is verse 20, and all the mixed peoples, all the kings of the land of Uz, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines. All the kings of the land of Uz. Now, 
We don't get a whole lot of geographical information about where this might be, but this does seem to suggest to us that it's a fairly large area of land. I mean, it's large enough for there to be multiple kings and multiple kingdoms within this area of land people knew as the land of Uz. In Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21, it says this, So rejoice and be glad, daughter of Edom, you residents of the land of Uz. So it was somehow connected to the land of, of Edom as well. Again, this leads most scholars to believe, and there's multiple theories, we, we're not certain, but the leading theory is this, that the land of Uz would have been in what we would consider modern-day Saudi Arabia, particularly the far northern part of Saudi Arabia. Knowing where this took place is interesting, but not spiritually significant. But what I, I, what I really want you to see is who Job was. This man in the land of Uz who was ready when everything went wrong. If we continue in verse 1 and we look a little bit deeper, we see that everything was right before it went wrong. We can start by looking at what we might call the piety of Job. It says there was a man in the country of Uz named Job, and he was a man of complete integrity. Some of your translations might even use the word perfect, perfect integrity. The Hebrew here can literally be translated that way, perfect, but the emphasis is not on Job's perfection. Job was not Jesus. Job was not perfect in that sense. Job was a man. He was a man just like you and I. He was mortal. He was made of flesh. He was flawed. His life was phased by the effects of sin. He was tempted, just like you and I are. He struggled with the same things that we do. He was not a perfect man, but he was a man of great and absolutely unquestionable integrity. We get a better idea of what the scriptures are saying here when we look at how this, this phrase is used in other places. For example, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, it says, he said, if you will carefully obey the Lord your God, and here comes the phrase, do what is right in his sight, pay attention to his commands, and keep all his statutes, I will not inflict any illness on you that I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Or in 1 Kings 15.5, it says, for David did what was right in the Lord's sight. Again, that same phrase. Or 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 23 and 24, says, As for me, I vow that I will not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. I will teach you the good and the right way. Again, that same phrase, the right way. Above all, fear the Lord and worship him faithfully with all your heart. Consider the great things he has done for you. See, the emphasis here really is not the perfection of Job. It's that Job was doing what was right in God's eyes. He was a man of complete integrity. And that happened before everything went wrong. It happened in verse 1. We, we hear who Job is before anything else of Job's life, before we hear of anything that goes wrong in his life. And trust me, a lot goes wrong. Before any of that, we find that he is a man who's doing what is right in the eyes of God. He's a man of integrity He's a man of moral substance. He's a good person. He has a good, solid heart, as we're going to learn in this series. And all of that was in place in his life long before his entire world falls apart. If I can, I would like to point out two important words of caution or two important things about this here. The first one would be this. Just because you have everything right in your life, and just because you are a person of great integrity, that doesn't mean at some point in your life, everything's not going to go wrong. Just like it didn't matter on April 23rd, 2016, who I was, or what I did, or how good or bad of a pilot I was. When everything went wrong, it just went wrong. It didn't care who I was. In the same way, we, we see this kind of thing in the life of Job. No matter who you are, 
Things are going to go wrong. Something is going to happen. Something is going to totally be outside of your control at some point in your life. You're going to have a moment when you feel like everything is going wrong. It doesn't matter how good you are or how right you are, how great your integrity is. It can still happen. But if you want to be unwavering in that moment, if you want to be unwavering in that situation, if you want your faith to be steady and steadfast and strong in that moment where everything's going right, you've got to do the work before it goes wrong. You've got to make sure your heart is right, your integrity is right, your character is right. You cannot wait until your whole world falls apart to then go and try to get everything right. And let's be honest, that's what most people try to do. We wait until our whole world is falling apart to really get serious about getting right with God. We wait till our whole world is falling apart to wait to try to become a person of character and integrity. It's like it's, it's like we start studying the day after we took the test. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You've got to be ready, and you've got to be right before everything goes wrong. The time to work on it is now. You study for a test before you take the test, amen? Or at least you're supposed to, right? The test is always much easier if you study for it long before you take it. So we've got to be right before it goes wrong. The second thing I would say is this. You need to be honest with yourself about where you are with the Lord right now today. Young people, old people, moms, dads, rich people, poor people. I don't care where you are in life. You need to be honest with God and honest with yourself right now today. So many times we can convince ourselves that everything is right when it really isn't. I can't tell you how many times this happens. I think we just see it more now because of social media. We'll, we'll see things on social media where people make everything look like everything's right. Like they make everything look like everything's right with their marriage, you know, this great vacation they just took or this, this great date they just went on or this great conference they just attended as a couple and then three weeks later, they announced they're getting a divorce. They made everything look like it was right, but everything wasn't right. Everything was actually in the process of going wrong. Or people make everything look, right, look like it's right or sound like it's right at work. Oh, I love my job. Everything's great at work. Oh, my boss loves me. Everything's going good. I'm in line for the next promotion. Everything's good. And you talk to them three or four months later, and they're not there anymore. Everything wasn't right. Or people make everything look like it's right with their kids because our kids are a reflection of us and we want things to look good with our kids and so we try to make everything look like it's right with them or we try to make everything look like it's right with our finances when we know secretly behind the scenes everything's falling apart everything's a mess we're in big trouble but to everybody else we can make it look like it's right Kids do this. They try to make everything look right with their grades. Oh, I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing really good, Dad. And then you get that report card, and you're like, I thought you were doing great. This doesn't look like great to me. This, this isn't even mediocre in my mind, right? We can make things look right, and we do the same thing with God. We try to make ourselves become convinced that everything's right. We try to make everybody around us think everything is right. We'll, we'll even try to convince God that everything's right when it's not. And it'll be a very short time before at some point everything's going to go wrong and reveal that everything certainly was not right. One of the best things we can do, one of the best things you can do for yourself, for your family, for your marriage for your life, for your relationship with you and the Lord, one of the very best things you can do is just be honest with God. Job really does have it all together. Things really were right in his life before everything went wrong. You know how we know? In Job chapter 2, God describes Job. 
And I want you to see how God described Job. Jump with me to Job chapter 2, and we're going to get to this in future weeks. But in Job 2, verse 3, it says this, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. He still retains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to destroy him for no good reason. I want you to notice that God described Job just the way he's described in verse 1. Job wasn't trying to fool anybody. This is really who he was. A man of integrity, a man who turned away from evil, a man who loved the Lord, a man who was good. My question, my challenge to you here for this point would be this. Would God describe you the same way you describe you? Would, would God describe you the, way, the same way you describe you in your friend circles or the same way you're describing you in your social media feed or the same way you're describing you to your family or even the same way you're describing you to yourself? Would God describe you the same way? If not, there's a problem. You might want to get that right before everything goes wrong. We have to remember that it's really, really easy to fool the world but it is absolutely impossible to fool the one who created the world. If we want to make sure, and I mean be absolutely certain we are right before God, before things go wrong, we have got to be honest. The next thing is this. I want you to consider the the posture of Job. Look at the posture of Job. These next three words give us x-ray vision into the heart of this man. Look at this with me. There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity. And then these next three words, who feared God. He feared God. Now to really understand these three words, you have to understand that in the culture and in the Hebrew language in which this is written, the word fear has a much broader meaning than it has for us today. The word fear in our language, in the English language, is, is a very narrow word. It means to be scared. It means to be frightened. And, and that would be a great way to describe how I felt with Peter in that airplane that day. There was fear involved. But in the Jewish culture... <clears throat> And in the Hebrew language, this word for fear is actually much broader. It, it, it actually can mean reverence or awe. It actually means reverence or awe more than it does to be scared or afraid. That, that's the posture of Job's heart. He's in awe of who God is. He loved the Lord. And he was in awe and great reverence of who God was. This is why verses like Proverbs 1-7 say, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and discipline. That's not being scared or being afraid. It's living in reverence and awe. Or Proverbs 8-13, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech, he says. See, we don't hate evil or these other things because we're scared of God. We hate evil because we're in awe of the way God has saved us from it, the way God rescues us from it, the way God forgives us when we slip back into it. We're in awe and reverence of God. That's the fear of the Lord. We hate it not out of a a spirit of fear or dread. We hate it out of great reverence for the holiness of God. We hate it because we know that his call on our life in Christ is, is so strong, and we're just so in awe of it. See, Job had this posture before the Lord, this posture of reverence, this posture of awe, this posture of love that made him right. That was right in his life before everything went wrong. Church, if we want to be unwavering, if we want to be solid, if we want to be steadfast, if we want to be steady when everything is crumbling and crashing around us, when the chaos erupts, if we want to be steady in that moment, then we have to live our lives with our hearts in a holy and right posture before the Lord. 
So I want to challenge you again here in this point. I want to challenge you with another challenge. I want to challenge you this week to just sit in the awe of God. Sit in reverence of God this week. We're going to do this in a thousand different ways, but I want to challenge you to be intentional about it. To just let your heart sit and soak up the aweness of God. Maybe you just sit there one night under the night sky, just in reverence and awe of who God is. Or maybe it's just in the silence of the early morning as the sun is coming up. Or maybe it's in the middle of the chaos at your job or at your school or in the middle of the finals or whatever, and you just remember that God loves you no matter what, and you just have a a moment of awe and reverence of who he is. We can do this in 10,000 ways this week. I just want to encourage you to be intentional about sitting in the midst of the awe and the reverence of who God is, a posture like Job had, a posture of fearing God in a holy way. And then here's the third and final thing that was right in Job's life. We could call it the purity of Job. This, this last one, it's so easy to see, but it's so hard to do in our culture and in our world and in our lives. We, we all know We all know that we're supposed to run to good things. We all know that we are supposed to accept and acknowledge God things in our lives. We all know that we're supposed to chase after good and holy things. But church, can I remind you that we are also called to forsake and shun evil things. Those are two different things. There are many today who know and are even trying to run after the good things of God, but are still allowing evil things into their lives, into their families, into their marriages, into their finances, into into whatever. It's not that they're not chasing good things. They are. They're doing that. But they're, they're not shunning and forsaking the evil things. I want you to look at these last four words in Job 1.1. It says, Job turned away from evil. He wasn't just running to God. He was turning away from the evil in his world and in his culture. The literal translation here says he shunned evil. He refused to be a part of it. He turned away from it. He shunned it. He was going to have no part of it. In other words, church, when it came to evil, when it came to the corrupt culture in which he was in, when it came to the temptations that came his way, he he did not try to tolerate them, he shunned them. He didn't toy around with them, he shunned them. He did not attempt to tame them and control them, he shunned them. He did not toil over, how do I make sense of this, he just shunned it. The psalmist offers some sound counsel in Psalms 34, 11 through 14. He says, come children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life, to enjoy what is good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. And then he says in verse 14, turn away, shun, turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. It doesn't get much clearer than that. I want you to imagine with me for one moment, imagine how different our world would be if people just did this one thing. Imagine how different your world would be. Imagine how different your family or your marriage would be. Imagine how different your workplace would be if everybody just did this one thing, just turned away from evil and did what is good. Just imagine. Can we all agree that our week would be better if we just did that? That our marriage would be better if we just did that? That we would sleep better at night if we just did that, just turned away from evil and did what is good? Can we not all agree that our kids are going to do better and live better and have a better life if we help teach them and show an example to them of what it looks like to turn away and to shun evil and to just chase after the good and the God things of the world? Church, we marvel at the unwavering faith of Job, and we should. For those of you who know the story, you already know what's coming. For those of you who don't, you're going to see why we marvel at the unwavering faith of Job. We should, because it's amazing. 
But my fear is this. My fear is that in our marveling of his unwavering faith, we're actually missing what made his faith unwavering in the first place. The fact that he took forth, took the effort to put forth the effort to get everything right in his life before everything went wrong is not an insignificant thing. I want to close with this. I know you want everything to go right in your life. I want everything to go right in my life. We want everything to go right in our church. We want everything to go right in our finances. We want everything to go right in our homes and in our businesses. We want everything to go right. That's the hope. That's the dream. That's the goal. That's our desire. But sometimes things go wrong. Every time I get in my airplane, I want everything to go right. But sometimes things go wrong. And we know things go wrong. So since we know things go wrong, shouldn't we do everything we can to make sure before they do, everything else is right? Everything needs to be right before it goes wrong. As we continue through this series, you're going to see Job pass, and in many ways, I would say ace, which you might think is an impossible test. He's able to pass and ace that test because he was ready for it, And long before he faced the test, he was ready for it. Are you right with the Lord? Are you ready to meet the Lord today? To stand before him and give an account of your life? Can I give you an astounding statistic before we close? Think about this. Today, 150,000 people, 150,000 people will die today. And every single one of them have something on their calendar for tomorrow. For next week. Every single one of them have something on their calendar for this summer. Since we started this service, 6,250 people have died since we started this morning. And every single one of them had plans for this afternoon. If everything went wrong right now and you stood face to face with Jesus today, would you be ready for that conversation? Everything's got to be right before it goes wrong. And the only way to get everything right between you and God is through the power and the provision of the blood of Jesus Christ. The one who died for your sins to restore you back to a right, pure, holy relationship with God. If you're not right with the Lord, you need to get right today. Jesus died for you to restore you. He loves you, and he wants you to be in a right relationship with God. You can be forgiven this hour. Get everything right before everything goes wrong. Repent and be forgiven today. Let's pray. If that's you, if you can hear me, if you're in the room, if you're watching, if you're listening, whatever the case may be, if you have never given your life to the Lord, if you have never cried out to him for salvation, we invite you to repent, to believe, to confess, and to get right with God this moment. We're not going to ask you to walk an aisle, to raise a hand, to stand up. We're going to ask you to pray with all the faith you can muster up right there where you are and ask the Lord to come into your life. If that's you, just say this. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. And when I walked in here today, I was not right with you. But because of the work of the cross, the blood and the sacrifice of your son, that's not going to be my story when I walk out. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me. By faith, this very hour, I pray that you would save me, that you would transform me, that you would change me. Lord, that you would make me new. Father, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for loving me and dying for me. 
Father, as we close today, Lord, I thank you for these who've gathered here today to worship you. I pray everything goes right in their life today. Lord, my prayer is everything would go right in their life this week, this month, this year, for the rest of their lives. I wish I could guarantee them everything was going to go right, but because we live in a fallen and a sinful world, I know there are going to be moments, days, times where everything goes wrong. And so, Lord, because I know that, my prayer is this. My prayer is that they would get everything right so that when it goes wrong, they can stand fast. Lord, that their faith would be unwavering and that their great test would turn into a great testimony just as Job's does, as we will see in the weeks to come. Lord, we thank you for this great example of this man who lived in a place that we do not know where it actually even was, But Lord, we know that he was there and we know that he stood that test. Because before everything went wrong, he got everything right. Thank you for making a way for us through the cross to have everything be right in our lives spiritually. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We celebrate you. And we sit in reverence and awe of who you are this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Pete. Thanks so much for watching this sermon from Cowboy Fellowship. We hope you enjoy it. I want to ask you, if you don't mind, be sure you hit the subscribe button, the like button, and then leave a comment, an encouraging word down below. All three of those things are so encouraging to us. They also help with the YouTube algorithm and help us as we're trying to get the good news out to the world. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for being a part of our online family. We pray God blesses you today.